So what, what I'm going to try to do uh, today is to talk about one part of my lab, which has been trying to take what we learned about the structure of human papillomaviruses and try to adapt what we know about the structure to developing next generation papillomavirus vaccines. And so the, I'm going to first give you a little, I'm sure many of you know the background of HPV vaccines, but I'm going to try to emphasize the points that are pertinent to next generation vaccines. And, and then we'll go through the current vaccines and then how we can make them better. So I'm sure you know that uh, cervical cancer is actually the second leading cause of cancer deaths in women worldwide. Right? And it's been estimated about 350,000 women a year die from cervical cancer. And the, the statistics in India are really are quite stunning. It, it, cervical cancer kills more women in India than breast cancer. So this is really quite an amazing problem. So HPV infection is the primary causative uh, event in the development of cervical cancer. All lesions contain viral DNA. And there are certain high-risk subtypes, which we'll talk about in a minute. And these are important for making vaccines. Also important for making vaccines, that neutralizing antibodies against any specific type are really type-specific. That is, there's very little cross-reactivity between antibodies against 16 and 18 and so forth. So if you're going to have a vaccine, you're going to have to put in a lot of different types. And here are the most important types. And these are the high-risk HPV types. And of the current vaccines, which we'll talk about in a minute, they include uh, proteins from uh, HPV 16 and 18, which cover about 70% of all the uh, high-risk papillomavirus types. Uh, and then there's a sort of a potpourri of other ones and this is really uh, complicates making additional vaccines because uh, there's diminishing returns about which ones you might include in a next generation vaccine. There, uh, uh, there are hints out there that Merck is trying to make a non-avalent vaccine, trying to cover more and more types. But as you can see, if you're only covering 70% of the high-risk types, you still need cervical cancer screening, which means pap smears, and that means cost uh, to the healthcare system. And, uh, of in the United States, which is about three to four billion dollars a year. So there's obviously a need for covering more types. The, um, this is another stunning statistic for me, uh, at least in my mind, which when I teach virology now, HPV infection accounts for about 5% of all cancers in the world. And in fact, as a matter of fact, infectious diseases account for 20% of all cancers in the world. So th that's also hepatitis B and uh, Heliobacter pylori. Uh, those are the other big players. But this is an amazing number of, 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 of cancers, mostly cervix. And, and recently, there's been a, a real increase in oropharyngeal cancers, which uh, is really the justification for, uh, I think, the main justification now for giving these vaccines for, to men. So who needs the HPV vaccines the most? Well, certainly developed countries can afford these vaccines. These vaccines are very expensive. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in less developed countries, cervical cancer is really a, a, a big problem because there's no pap smear screening. So this is, this, is the, this is the area that we want to develop next generation's vaccines for. And so we'll talk about what, need, what are their criteria for making a vaccine in these countries. And of course, the major one is cost. So here's where structural uh, biology comes in. This is actually a cryo-electron micrograph uh, done at the NIH of a bovine papillomavirus virion. And, 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 and what you see here are the, the protein subunits on the viral surface. And, and there's these subunits, these pentamers, these star-like shapes here, are called capsomeres. And there's 72 capsomeres, or pentamers, in the full virus particle. And here's the atomic structure of an HPV uh, pentamer. Uh, this is actually HPV-16 pentamer that we saw with Steve Harrison over 10 years ago. So the point of this is that we know a lot about the structures of these viruses. We know them at atomic resolution. So we can make some good biological uh, guesses about how we can make a vaccine. So here's various different flavors of, of the uh, HPV 16L1 atomic structure that we solved. Here's the uh, small particle that was originally crystallized, the pentamer, and then a single uh, subunit of L1 in the pentamer. 
showing these surface loops, which are exposed on the outside of the virus, which contain all the neutralizing epitopes for these viruses, and also the receptor binding sites potentially for these viruses. So this is a long time ago. So it took us a while to figure out how we might adapt all of this knowledge to making new vaccines. So this is actually the pentamer. And this is mapped on top of the pentamer are uh, uh, studies from Neil Christensen's group where uh, the residues found for several neutralizing monoclonal antibodies against HPV-16. And the point of this slide is that these neutralizing epitopes are, one, they're non-contiguous peptide sequences. That is, they're peptide sequences coming from different parts of this molecule together. So you need a native particle or a native pentamer to get neutralizing antibodies being made. And secondly, that the neutralizing epitopes are, are available on the surface of a pentamer. You don't need a whole particle. Every pentamer has neutralizing antibody sites. There are a few neutralizing sites that may bridge pentamers, but they're very few. The other interesting thing that came out of the structural studies is if, if you look at a pentamer, and now we've heat mapped this pentamer for the uh, amino acid changes that occur in about, I think we heat, this heat maps for about 50 different types. And the red color shows the amino acid variability among those types, and the blue and the white shows the conserved sequences. And what you can see is that, that the atomic structure shows us that all the variability between these types is on the surface of the virus. And for the rest of the virus pentamer, everything's conserved. So of all the 150 or so different human types now that have been identified, all the sequence variability is on the surface, and everything else is the same. So um, in the late 1980s, actually, we were studying mouse polyomavirus assembly. And uh, when the baculovirus expression system came along, we had already made uh, mouse polyomavirus coat proteins expressed in, in baculovirus systems. And so we then uh, put L1, which is this major coat protein of that pentamer, into a baculovirus system. And when you express these protein and uh, proteins of a number of other viruses, for example, rotavirus is, vaccine is made in this way. Um, what happens is the following. For, this is actually an electron micrograph of a, a baculovirus cell expressing just the L1 protein. So this is a recombinant system, plasma membrane, microtubules, nuclear membrane. And what you can see on the inside of the nucleus are all these dense particles. And, the, and, and, and they're very regular. And these are virus-like particles. So the thing that's kept me fascinated about, about virus assembly is that how does the virus do this? As a matter of fact, when you take pentamers that you've purified from E. coli, which I'll show you in a minute, and for pap uh, papillomavirus, just allow disulfide bonds to form, you will make virus-like particles. So these proteins have evolved to assemble very quickly in the nucleus of the cell. And actually, the main problem we are now study in the other half of the lab is what keeps them from assembling until they're, they encounter their genome and they only encapsulate their genome and not spontaneously assemble randomly. So these particles are virus-like particles. This is actually a, a cryo-EM of, of polyomavirus virus-like particles, which is, were made before the L1 particles. And to at least 15 angstroms resolution, virus-like particles are identical in structure to a virus particle. So it makes great sense why virus-like particles may be good vaccine reagents, because they look exactly like the virus, except they don't have any viral DNA in the middle which makes them even better reagents because you don't have the problem of extraneous viral DNA or an infectious particle. So I'll just make a side point here. There's a, there's a, there's a small cottage industry uh, that actually uses these kind of virus-like particles for drug delivery. You can take these things and, and put drugs inside of them. People have put adriamycin inside of them. People have tar targeted the surface, those surface loops with different targeting uh, peptide epitopes to try to direct these particles to specific cells. and so to make, for example, siRNA delivery to specific cells. And so I'm not going to talk about that. But um, besides vaccines, these VLPs uh, have also been used for many other uh, re uh, therapeutic and, and purposes. 
So these are the currently marketed vaccines. And these, uh, these vaccines were made after virus-like particles were discovered. It was, you know, all you need is a, is, a, uh, is a cell with a nucleus, and you will get these particles made in the nucleus. So uh, uh, Merck makes Gardasil, and they make, and this is just L1 expressed in yeast, and you can purify these particles from the nucleus of a yeast par, uh, cell. And they've put in different types. They've put in type 6, 11, 16, and 18 into their vaccine. And uh, 6 and 11 are low risk of, of viruses that cause uh, venereal warts. So the, this vaccine very effectively prevents the development of venereal warts. And 16 and 18 are the high risk, most common high risk types. And Cerberix, which is the Glaxo product, only has 16 and 18. And they make their vaccine in baclovirus. So they have very large baclovirus production facility for that. Now the other important things about these vaccines for the purposes of the further discussion, first of all, there's only a few types in here and obviously we need more types. And is the adjuvant. Now the adjuvant, I don't know the way, I'm not an immunologist, but in my, uh, the adjuvant is basically the immunologist's dirty little secret of how to make everything much more immunogenic. And so without an adjuvant, Many proteins, not these actually, are, are very poorly immunogenic. And so for Merck, all they do is add aluminum hydroxide, alum, which is the most common adjuvant in most vaccine formulations. If you get a tetanus shot or a DPT, you'll have alum in, in, in your vaccine. Uh, Glaxo uh, has another uh, additional component, which is a monophosphorolipid A, or uh, an endotoxin. Uh, endotoxin, not the full endotoxin, but a neutered endotoxin so that it gives you good uh, T cell reactivity without giving you the major side effects of endotoxin. And so they're actually the only company in the world that makes vaccines with MPL3 added to it. And actually, that probably makes this vaccine a bit better in the long run for a sustained immunogenic uh, response than, than this vaccine. But they're both very good vaccines. As I said, this is baclovirus and this is yeast. Usually it's given in three separate shots. And the other thing is, in a minute we'll talk about the cost. So perplexing thing about these vaccines is they're given intramuscular, but they're going to prevent an infection that's going to occur in the epithelium. And how does that happen? When I was trained in medical school, you would think that you would need IgA to protect from something that's coming into your mucosal membranes. But actually, it's IgG. And, that, and, and actually, what happens is that in the cervical mucus, IgG is both uh, exudated and transudated into the cervical mucus and probably neutralizes the virus particles in, in this area here. But, and that's the, mainly the hypothesis. Now, remember, or may not, I should tell you that to get infection, you have to get down to the basal cells here to cause infection. So as long as you prevent penetration down in the basal cells, you won't get an infection. So this is the, one of the clinical trials done by Luisa Vila. This was uh, one of the phase uh, one clinical trials, I believe. There's a lot of numbers here, but the main point of this is that these vaccines are unbelievably efficacious. They are 95% efficacious. They're some of the best vaccines that are on the market. I mean, even your measles vaccine or your chickenpox vaccine is only about 70% effective. These are 95% effective. So they're very good vaccines. But what are the issues that we have to face now going forward for the next generation? The main one is cost. These vaccines, at least in the United States, cost $120 per dose. So you need three doses, that's $360. So, of course, in an underdeveloped country, you can't, even, you can't afford giving that. You need a vaccine in a less developed area that's probably going to cost less than a dollar a dose, even that. So the current hepatitis B vaccines, which are now made in country in India and Brazil, cost, for example, 25 cents a dose. So that's the kind of dosing you want, the cost you want to get per dose, where you can actually give the vaccine to everyone for basically for free. So cost is a big problem. 
Type-restricted protection is another problem. You're never going to get protection against all the possible oncogenic types. You would need you know, 12 different proteins in one vaccine. And that's pretty difficult to make, no matter what formulation. Cold chain. You may or may not be familiar with this issue, but it's a problem with most vaccines. And in particular, for example, polio vaccine. Polio vaccine is very temperature sensitive. If you allow it out of the refrigerator for over three hours, it's probably inactivated. And so this is a very difficult problem for delivering vaccines in, for example, uh, places where they don't have electricity, refrigerators, or just hot climates like Central Africa, Pakistan, where they're having outbreaks of polio right now. Delivery, all of these are intramuscular. It would be really nice to get a different delivery system because a syringe and a needle actually cost about 25 cents. So a number of people have been working on inhalation deliveries and other modes of delivery. Adjuvants, we would like really good adjuvants. Aluminum hydroxide's good. We would like to have that other adjuvant, that MPL3, but that's patented by Merck, and there's, n and there's a big industry now making new adjuvants. For example, the new flu vaccines will probably be adjuvanted with a, a new adjuvant to make the flu vaccines a lot better than they are now. And finally, acceptance. Acceptance, I put down here mainly for the United States. There's a lot of uh, people in the United States that think that if you give this vaccine, you're going to make your daughter more sexually promiscuous. Um, I don't think that that's really an issue for most of the enlightened world. Um, but in the United States, that's a religious issue in some parts. And it's really a problem because in the United States, the, uh, the market penetration for the vaccines, for Merck, for example, is only about... 25 to 30 percent of the targeted market that's available, and most of it's because of acceptance, because of people who don't want to give it to their daughters. So let's talk about what's coming, or what I think should come, and that's trying to address some of these issues. And what I'm going to talk about mainly is developing a capsimer vaccine. So what are capsimers? Those are those pentamers that make up the virus-like particle. And what is good about pentamers? Well, you can make pentamers in E. coli. So when you express the L1 protein in bacteria, you don't get these assembled particles. You actually need a nucleus, a nuclear import, and some magic going on in the nucleus to get virus-like particles. But you can make pentamers in E. coli. And so the issue is, are pentamers a good vaccine? Can you scale up production and make these in, in bacteria that will make them uh, economical? Now, we've been working on this problem now for maybe a dozen years. And in the beginning, uh, because of laziness or ease of recombinant expression of these proteins, we had tagged our L1 protein with glutathione S transferase at the amino terminus. And this just made the protein very easy to purify, as you well know. You can purify this as a homogenate from E. coli, put it over a glutathione sephirose column, basically in one or two steps have this perfectly clean protein. And then in the laboratory, of course, you can cleave this off and get pure pentamers. So this was a very easy way in the laboratory to test the immunogenicity of just pentamers um, and do many preclinical studies. So what I'm going to show you just briefly is that capsimers, this pentamers, react in a serotype-specific manner with neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. They have all the conformational specific epitopes. In animal models, and I'll show you the dog model, they elicit neutralizing antibodies. So that's an important preclinical model. You have to have a model. And what I'm going to emphasize here is actually, over the course of the last 20 years, the model systems for testing these vaccines preclinically has dramatically improved. And that hopefully, and I'll try to get to this point that maybe you can make, when you make these capsimers in bacteria, they may be less expensive to manufacture. Now again, this is also an issue because we know the cost of goods now for um, Gardasil and Cervarex. And the cost of goods is how much it takes to actually purify those guys from yeast and, and Bacalo. And it's probably not the $120 they're charging us. It's probably $4.50. OK, so there's a large profit margin for these companies. OK, but still $4.50 is a lot for a single dose vaccine. So this is one of the very earliest types of assays. And I just show this as sort of an antique um, 
for showing how efficacious a protein might be against infection. And this is back when we could only purify virus from HPV 11 or, or wart lesion. So you can get some virus out of a wart, not very much. And then you can put the virus on keratinocytes in culture. And they don't complete a full life cycle. You need a raft culture for doing that. But you can get early viral transcripts made. And then if you have this sort of wart purified virus and you add to it sera that you have from an animal that you've immunized, you can detect whether you make early transcripts or not. And so this was the earliest model, the earliest assay system for determining whether you had uh, neutralizing antibodies. And, and in this early assay, we made capsimers for HPV 11 and showed in this assay that when you injected rabbits with these capsimers, you got neutralizing at antibodies. Fortunately, the assays have gotten a lot better. And also in the, in the early, very earliest studies with HPV 11 uh, capsimers, you could show that for characterized neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, that they reacted with these capsimers. But for example, the HPV 11 capsimers did not react with monoclonals that recognized HPV 16. So all this was good. All this was good. And probably one of the more interesting things, and, and that's become very important now, is that you can take these capsimers and then precipitate them as powders and reconstitute them, and they're immunogenic. So that was very interesting, because that said that maybe capsimers would be a more robust antigen as far as storage and, and other properties. This was done a long time ago. And of course, this was, will show how much we've improved upon this. So this, you always need an animal model. And it's very difficult for papillomaviruses to have an animal model. There's only two that I know of, the rabbit and, and the dog. And this is the dog model. And this is the dog model was actually used to prove the efficacy of the virus-like particle vaccine models. So what you do is, in the, in the, in the VLP models, you made virus-like particles from canine oral papillomavirus L1 protein. And these are beagle dogs. And what you do is you immunize the dogs with these VLPs. You boost them. And then a virus challenge is where you take virus that you've isolated from one of these lesions into a naive dog, brush it around in their mouth with a toothbrush. OK, science is really down to the nitty gritty here. And, and, then, and then you wait and see whether the dogs develop these lesions in their mouth. And that really was the lack of appearance of these meant that you had in an animal model protection using your antigen. Now, this is just an aside. I love dogs. I have a dog. I love my dog. And these dogs all do very well because they have good immune systems. And they get rid of these lesions within you know, a month or so because their T cells eradicate them, just like they eradicate warts on your skin. So all the dogs are alive, and they're never euthanized. Okay. That's important for the United States. Okay. So this was our first dog study, actually. And so this is actually we, when we use GSTL1 pentamers in dogs. And, and, and I just wanted to point this out. This is we're giving nanograms of protein in a 25, in a 20 pound dog. So it's a 10 kilo dog. Um, and then this is without any adjuvant at all. And then you increase the dose to 20 nanograms. And then you start seeing smaller lesions. And by 400 nanograms, you had no lesions in the dog. And we redid this study. And the cutoff point here is 100 nanograms. 100 nanograms of protein without adjuvant in a dog will protect them from infection. So this actually was the very similar results to virus-like particles and actually led to the development and, and, and preclinical data for production of those, of those vaccines. OK. So we'll talk about the new, new neutralizing assay in a minute. But I just want to show you that, that capsimers may not be as, as all that good as, for example, the, the currently used Cervarix vaccine. Because, and I'll describe this neutralization assay in a minute. But when you give capsimers to a mouse and then measure neutralizing antibody titers, they're about eightfold less on the average than Cervarix in a mouse. 
and they're always type specific. So for example, if you give a capsimere from 16 and then measure titers against 18, you don't get any titers at all. So what are the goals for a capsimere vaccine? So cost, we'll talk about that in a minute. Stability, can the vaccine be formulated to withstand high temperatures for long periods of time? You can't do this for Gardasil or Cervix. They still require refrigeration. Adjuvants, can you, actually this is a goal for many vaccines. Can you, usually you have to give a prime and a boost. Can you just give one shot and give protection? Can you make an adjuvant that's so good you only have to give one shot or just two? And finally, and this, I think this is very important, can you, can you make the vaccine production so simple that you can make it in country? So can you make this vaccine in India, in Pakistan, in Argentina, for example, like they do for hepatitis B vaccine? Because then you will lower the cost dramatically. So this is our current capsimir production. So we've been able now, without GST on the end, so, no, so the problem with making proteins with GST and hexahist tags is that the Food and Drug Administration anywhere in the world will not allow those vaccines to enter human beings. So you have to cleave off the tag before you put it into a human, and that cleavage reaction is not biomanufacturing friendly, okay, to say the least. Why, why can't you have tags? Well, that's an interesting. First of all, because the tag is not doing anything good for the person. And second of all, if you have another vaccine with a GST tag on and you had the other vaccine before, you're not going to get a response to the second vaccine because you get neutralization already. So this is a L1 protein from 16 made without a tag. It's made in bacteria. And here it basically has been put over two simple columns. It comes out as a single peak. This is an electron micrograph. It's beautiful pentamers. So it's, it, I showed this in, so I don't know how many of you are graduate students and maybe postdocs here, um, but you probably remember that your whole thesis could be summarized in two slides, right? I mean, basically that's what it comes down to. And so this actually is 10 years worth of work right here. Okay, so just one slide. So now we, we've, we've um, we wanted to know how we could press this. So this, we're making our bacteria, of course, in shaker flasks in the laboratory. And the critical thing about making bacteria for production of proteins in the laboratory is what optical density can you get the bacteria because the amount of protein that you can get is related to the optical density. And so you go to a bioreactor, which of course you have many in your building here. And so we've done this on a small scale. This is just a one or three liter bioreactor. And so right now we're at about the scale of about one milligram of per, pure protein per OD per liter of, of culture. So we can get a, a, an OD of 100 in a liter in a bioreactor, 80 to 100. And so that means we're making 80 to 100 milligrams of the protein. This is pure end product per liter. And because I didn't tell you, I didn't point out in the previous slide, what you need in a vaccine is about 50 micrograms per dose. So now we're getting about 1,500 doses per liter. And this is just in an academic laboratory. I'm sure if we were experts, we could probably do this a little bit better. So if you multiply that out to what the cost of goods here is, we're well below a dollar a dose, I think. So, and, and, and these, all these capsimers look fine, and they all, the other, the other quality, the other things that I've learned about making proteins uh, for, for vaccines is you have to have quality control steps. And the quality control steps here are conformational specific monoclonal antibodies. If your protein reacts with these monoclonals, it's probably folded correctly. And all of these proteins react with the conformational specific monoclonals. So they're fine. And so this is a technology that was developed by Chris Buck some years ago at the NIH. And it's basically to take 293T T cells. So these are 293T, uh, 293 cells, human cells. Uh, adenovirus transform cells uh, with a couple of copies of SV40 large T in them. And then you have expression plasmids that have a, a T antigen origin of replication. So these plasmids replicate to high copy number in these cells. 
you put the coat proteins of the papillomavirus in these cells. They get expressed. They move to the nucleus. And then you can put a target plasmid in here. And, and just by accident, just by the fact of these guys being in the same nucleus of where these guys are assembling, some small fraction of these target plasmids with a reporter GFP or whatever you want to put on it gets encapsidated. And what you get out is pseudovirus. And actually, only about one in 500, one in 1,000 particles actually has a reporter. But that's sufficient to do neutralization assays with a very nice reporter gene here. I should, this is an interesting anecdote, actually. Merck makes their vaccine <clears throat> in yeast with an L1 that still contains the DNA binding domain on the protein. And when they express it in yeast, because of this phenomena of randomly picking up extraneous nucleic acids, all of their VLPs are contaminated with fragments of cell DNA, RNA, whatever. And so they actually, in their process of making their vaccines, have to completely dissociate their VLPs, remove the nucleic acid on a column, and then reassemble them using that disulfide reducing agent trick. And that was, was a problem with Gardasil. I don't know whether Merck, I mean, Glaxo has to do that because <clears throat> I think Glaxo was at least smart to take the DNA binding domain off of the protein, and so they don't have to do that. So <clears throat> this is actually a neutralization assay <clears throat> for exactly the question that you ask. Using capsimers, at do this is a dose response assay with just taking the capsimers and adding alum to them, not perfect formulation, comparing them to Cervarix in a, in a mouse experiment. And what you can see here, I, Cervarix is right here. And this Cervarix has eight micrograms. Of, of the protein. And so it's very comparable. Let's see, we're, we're eight micrograms plus alum. You need alum to get a good response of our capsimers. So in this assay, and there's some variability here because sometimes there's variability in these experiments. But um, even with two micrograms, you get a very good titer. This is one in 200,000 titer. OK, so you make a very good antibody response with capsimers and just alum. And we've made 18. 18 gives, and again, Cervarix contains 18. So there's 18 here, L1. Here's actually a mixture that we made. We just wanted to see whether if you mixed a lot together, you might get squelching of the response of one type to another. And you can see that pretty much pretty good titers at 1 to 200,000. All these other ones from these other types don't give any antibody response in an 18 neutralizing assay. And here's 33. 33, Cervarix doesn't have 33 in it. But our 33 capsimers give very good neutralizing responses, even alone or in a mixture. So the answer to your question, very good antibody responses, very good antibody responses. So I, I just briefly want to go over one. And this is not our work. But I thought it was very important to point this out. Because this is another way of getting a new vaccine. And it's done by Richard Roden at Johns Hopkins that we work with. And that's to get broad protection. Remember, you have to give type specific. So you have to give a capsimer to each specific type. But what if you had an antigen that would cover many different types? And what Richard's found was that you can, there's a protein that does this. And that is the L2 protein. The L2 protein is the minor capsid protein of this virus. There's about one protein for every 12 pentamers. It's absolutely required for infection. Okay, And so what Richard's done is use this as a potential vaccine reagent. And this is based upon the work of John Schiller and, and, and Patricia Day at the NIH, who have defined the infectious cycle of HPV. When HPV hits the basement membrane and the proteoglycans, it starts its uncoding process. And during the uncoding process, L2 is exposed. It's not exposed here. So in, a, in an L1 neutralizing antibody, it would react with the virus out here. If you have an L2 antibody, it would react down here. And it would react with when the epitope's exposed here as it becomes opened up. And what Richards defined is a, a peptide between amino acids 11 and 88 of different types that cross-react between types. So 
an antibody of the L2 of 16 will react with 33 and so forth. It's not a very good uh, antibody response, but what Richard's done is made a tandem array of these and has made a new vaccine out of it, which is made in E. coli and which is just a continuous epitope vaccine. Okay, so there's not, there's not conformational specific epitopes, it's a continuous epitope. And so if you had an antibody against that epitope, it would recognize the virus at that specific stage of the life cycle. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to go through that. But here's the final model. So neutralizing antibodies, that, that pseudovirus model is great. It's going to revolutionize f future clinical trials because now you can do comparative studies of neutralizing titers in humans. But here's the ultimate assay, which is very not uh, high throughput, and also developed at the NIH in John Schiller's lab. And that is a mouse assay where you actually uh, take a pseudovirus, you immunize with whatever you want to immunize with, you pretreat the mice with steroids to make their uh, vaginal mucosa receptive to the virus, and then you actually uh, infect these mice in the vagina with a wire brush with pseudoviruses. Now, if the mouse is protected, you won't get any uh, reporter protein being made. So this virus, this uh, mouse was not protected, but this, vi uh, this mouse was protected. So this is actually a mouse challenge model. It's pretty cumbersome, but it's really quite important because the L2 vaccines do not give you neutralizing antibodies in that other assay. So this is the only way you can actually prove that these guys are efficacious. And through this assay, Richard's proven that this will protect a mouse against challenge. I'm not going to go through those slides. So finally, just as a, as a side point, because I want to get to the real, real what I think is really important here, we also tried to make a therapeutic prophylactic vaccine. So this is the monster that we made. So what is a therapeutic prophylactic vaccine? So first of all, you want to have prophylactic antibodies from your capsid protein. But then if you're already infected, you would like to have cytotoxic lymphocytes that see the infected cell and kill it. This is sort of the holy grail of anti-tumor vaccines, right? You want to make a CTL that's going to recognize a tumor antigen. But this is probably conceptually easier because this is not a self-antigen. This is a viral antigen. So you don't have that problem with self. However, it's still never been done. There's no therapeutic viral vaccines out there. It's a holy grail of vaccinology. But what we did was we had GST on the amino terminus, and then we hooked the E6 or E7 protein. And actually, we ended up with E7 because these are early viral proteins made in an infected cell. These are the oncoproteins of the virus. E7 is 92 residues long, and so it was more convenient to book at the carboxy terminus. And we made this monster protein in bacteria. And if you put this in a, in, a, in, a, in a mouse, you get very good CTLs, both against L1 and against E7. And more importantly, probably, is that if you take a tumor model where you have cells that are, that are infected or were transfected with E6 or E7, and they're making tumors in an animal, that if after 14 days of tumor growth you immunize with these proteins and generate CTLs against E7, you will not get any tumors. So this is preclinical data. This is the, an experiment done with our protein in, in collaboration with Lutz Giesemann in Heidelberg. But this proves that if you could make this protein, you might get a therapeutic vaccine. Unfortunately, you can't make this protein in bulk. As I showed you, it's a monster protein. It's huge. And to recombinantly make this at scale is not possible, or at least we've been unable to do it. But conceptually, you can make one. So what I wanted to leave you with is the future. And the future, and this is really a result of the fact that I moved into a new building about a year and a half ago. And in this building, next door to me were these chemical engineers. And you might think, well, chemical engineers, what do they know? Well, they happen to be the best chemical engineers in the world for vaccinology, for formulating vaccines. And uh, they were very much into making uh, powdered vaccines for anti-anthrax and other bioterrorism agents. 
And so they had developed a technology of freeze drying in glassy states. So engineers know, know about glassy states of proteins and, and, and sugars. And so they were able to do that. And they applied their technology to our capsimeters. And so now what I'm going to show you are freeze dried glassy state powders of our L1 vaccines. And the other problem that they have overcome, which the drug companies have failed to do in 15 years of vaccinology, is actually making a freeze dried powder vaccine that has an adjuvant in it. In other words, alum or alum plus MPL. Because as soon as they added it to their protein and then freeze dried it, it aggregated the protein and it wasn't immunogenic anymore. So we're freeze drying capsimers now. And, and fortunately, freeze drying is pretty easy. And actually, every drug company has a freeze drying apparatus that's huge because they freeze dry a lot of things. But you have to make the right formulation. And so this is pre-freeze drying. And this is our protein. This is a conformational specific antibody to HPV-16. This is an ELISA assay. This is just an antibody against that protein. Post-freeze dried, so we made a powder and then resuspended it. And it reacts similarly. And so these are all the controls. And so you can freeze dry it, resuspend it again, and it reacts with the antibodies in exactly the same way. And then the ultimate experiment, of course, is to take these powders with alum. And now we've even added in alum plus monophosphorolipid A, which is the ultimate adjuvant in my mind, um, freeze dried them. And we've even freeze dried them and then kept the powders around at 37 degrees for a couple of months. We now have powders out at 50 degrees for four months we're testing now in mice because they're very heat stable. And then we compared them with Gardasil here in a mouse. And you can see that they're even better than Gardasil almost. They're, they're as comparable to Gardasil. They're very good. This is actually didn't work very well because one of the, one of the mice injected actually didn't get, was not injected properly, and so that lowered it. But still, 1 in 80,000 titers again. And these are powders that had been resuspended and injected. So this, I think, is the future not only of this vaccine, but of many other vaccines, protein vaccines, where you can actually freeze dried powders, make them thermal stable, make them in bacteria, keep them in warehouses, keep them without the cold chain and get high immunogenicity with adjuvants. So now we're doing all of these studies. You have to do, of course, we've just finished the toxicology for capsimeres. They're totally safe. That's not surprising. Gardasil, Cerberix are safe. We've done all of those. And now we're going into phase one clinical trial uh, in Alabama as part of a, a project with Johns Hopkins to do the safety studies for capsimeres. It's a dose escalation study uh, where we will we'll, we'll prove, again, that this is absolutely safe in humans. I mean, you have to do that before you do a clinical trial phase two. And so hopefully this will be completed by the end of next year. And unfortunately, it takes a long time. And then phase two, you have to show equivalent, equivalent efficacy with the current vaccines out there. And fortunately, now we have very good neutralizing assays out there that we can do compare Cervarix to capsimeres in humans and show that they elicit the same neutralizing antibodies. And therefore, we don't have to go through what Merck and Glaxo went through, which was to do protection assays and to show that women didn't get infected by PCR over time, which was cost them $100 million. So I'd just like to thank the people in my laboratory it's particularly Kim and Dennis who work on this, and Natalie who work on this full time, and all of our collaborators, Richard at Johns Hopkins, Xiao Zhang and Steve that we've done all of our structural studies with, Ted who's the chemical engineer, and Jill and Marty who uh, worked at a company that's now just been bought, unfortunately, by Takeda and no longer is interested in making this, but they helped a lot with that uh, purification scheme. And here's our laboratory. And so thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Bob.